Oh, no, is it? Okay. Okay, uh, very uh, warm uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon at this first uh, webinar in a series hosted by the Simon Vale Center for Political Philosophy. Uh, my name is Adrian Pabst. I'm uh, a member of the Simon Vale Center, and it's my great uh, pleasure to welcome you. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker uh, and the panelists, uh, it gives me great honor to introduce the co-moderator, and that is uh, Governor Jerry Brown, who is known to all of us, but I want to uh, pay particular tribute uh, to him for making time for joining us uh, this afternoon and for co-moderating the seminar. Uh, I had a delightful uh, conversation with him a few days ago, um, which I think would be the subject of a seminar uh, in its own right, because he raised so many questions and made so many great points, and I, I'm sure we'll hear some of them uh, this afternoon. It was, all, of course, all based on Paul Grenier's essay, and that is what will be the focus of our conversations this afternoon. But Jerry Brown, as you all know, was twice uh, governor of the state of California for two uh, consecutive terms in each case in quite different eras, also um, attorney uh, and uh, you know attorney general as well as mayor of Oakland. So he's had a long distinguished public life uh, in politics, in public affairs, but also uh, as an intellectual figure who's always been keenly interested in questions of politics, of ethics, uh, of ontology, of metaphysics, uh, of science, of technology, uh, and has been a great thought leader as well as a great a political figure. So we're very honored to have him uh, with us and look forward to his, his comments and his questions. Um, but before we hear from, uh, from Governor Brown, um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Paul Grenier who has written a splendid essay on technology and truth and we will ask him in a minute to uh, make, in some sense, his case. Um, what I think um, I, I want to just say briefly about Paul is that he's, of course, the founder and president of the Simon Vell Center. Uh, and it's thanks to him and to the center that we're all here uh, today. He's an essayist and translator. He's been published very widely in American Affairs, The National Interest, The American Conservative, uh, Telescope, and, of course, uh, in many, many uh, translations, not to, not only into Russian, which he speaks and and uh, writes fluently, but also French and Spanish. He has worked as a simultaneous interpreter for U.S. Defense and State Departments for the Russian language for a long time. And the essay that we are uh, here today to discuss, uh, Technology and Truth, Reflections on Russia, America, and uh, Live Not by Lies, is the focal point of today's discussion. So before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to turn to Paul and ask him to, in some sense, set out his score for sort of five or eight minutes. And then we will bring in the panelists and Governor Brown and indeed the audience for some, I'm sure, very uh, challenging questions. So Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your essay, great gift, and for kicking us off this afternoon. Thank you, um, Adrian. Uh, it, it's really, an honor to, to be uh, able to have this conversation with people of this intellectual level. I, um, I really feel like an amateur uh, with, with all of you guys here. And so I, I, I think uh, my mission may not be so much to, to make my case or make my argument um, as to just sort of set forth a couple of um, the, the, the key themes an import of what I've tried to write, um, what I've tried to express uh, with, the, I, with the idea in the background that I, I really want to encourage people to take the time to, to, read, to, read, to read the essay uh, as a whole. All, all these different parts, I, I, they actually are all interrelated in ways that it's very difficult to summarize in five minutes. But if we, can, we can maybe explore some of those linkages uh, as we talk them through. And I, I may ask some questions of my own because I, I'm sure that I could learn, learn from all of you about uh, technology and truth as well. But the, I think one, one key message is that the technological mindset is 
somewhat surprisingly, is something that, that binds together a, a number of what appear to be disparate phenomena uh, in, in American society to begin with. I mean, first, it, 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 I think it, it answers a peculiar a peculiarity of, of our present moment, where you see that people who are allegedly on the left um, and rebellious and sort of even revolutionary finding common cause with, with intelligence circles in American politics very frequently. And, and that seems very peculiar. But, it, but what, what my uh, paper traces is, is an evolution of, of American society and culture and thought, starting already in the 1950s in particular, in the 60s, when business elites um, embraced a certain new way of looking at the world a way that, which was quite different from the way America had looked at the world uh, 20 or 30 years prior, a, a technological way of looking at the world. And, and then I discussed some actions of the military industrial complex and of the intelligence circles, which also buy into the same technocratic mind, mindset. And, th and then you have, uh, in more recent times, big tech in Silicon Valley become a, an, uh, all, ever more pervasive influence uh, on our society and our culture and adding at least the threat, if not the reality already, of a certain totalitarian uh, kind of control order within our society, a, a departure from, from previous ideas about what it means to be free in America, or at least an apparent departure. And then, and then the final category is, of course, you're like, you know, the woke revolutionaries who I, who I I referred to earlier, um, and so, so so one overarching thesis of of the of the essay is that all of them are participating in and um, and in fact you know, pursuing the logic of of technology and technocracy. And and in the in the paper, there's you know one of the perhaps a little bit more difficult sections, although not difficult for people like you, but maybe for, for some, the, uh, where I, I attempt to define what I mean by technocracy, what, what, what I mean in philosophical terms by technology. There's a, there's a few sentences actually at the outset of the paper, which got cut in the, uh, for, the, for reasons of, of, sp of time and space, or rather space in the, in the printed version, um, where, where I, Point out that one of the general characteristics of technological society is that it prior prioritizes the virtues of control and action over understanding. I might have added that it prior prioritizes action um, over contemplation, in, in particular. Um, and and I, I think I think that's that's really the key, is that you we have this constant dynamic of change oriented towards control and what we can't control we, we tend to get rid of and, and that's uh, or we demonize um, that, that's the, the basic I think overarching <clears throat> structure of the piece added on to that is something that which I think I should leave for later so as not to go on too long right now um, are the the elements that have to do with Simone Weil and her perception of, of America and of the East, what she calls the East. And I think that, you know, where this, this whole essay, in a sense, is really a, a meditation on Simone Weil's idea that, that the Western order uproots itself. It uproots itself from nature and it uproots itself from, from the, any kind of divine order, any kind of given order. Technocracy is precisely that uprooting and that as a process. Um, and the, the, we can go into more detail about why that, why that is the case. Uh, and then she says that in order for Europe, in order for the, a civilization which has been damaged by this concept to restore itself, it needs something that we only seem to be able to get from the East. Now, whether that I don't think she meant Russian Orthodoxy. I'm sure she didn't, she, but she she meant something. She meant a divine principle, which probably includes Eastern Orthodoxy. But for her, no doubt, it also includes Hinduism. But that's that's something we can we can talk about. But th there's a there's a start for you at any rate.
Paul, thank you very much. You have been uh, more than concise and certainly not exhausted the eight minutes or so that you had, which is very good. It gives us more time to, uh, to uh, put questions and comments to you. And in a minute, I will ask Governor Brown to kick us off. But I do want to introduce our two uh, panelists this afternoon um, who have joined us. Um, first of all, uh, David C. Uh, Schindler, DC uh, Schindler, who is Professor of Metaphysics and Anthropology at the John Paul II Institute at Catholic University in Washington, DC, the author of many um, foundational studies on the nature of freedom, uh, including most recently, Freedom from Reality, the Diabolical Character of Modern Liberty, um, and also a board member of the Simon Vale Center. So uh, David, a very warm uh, welcome. Great to have you with us. And Daniel McCarthy, who's the editor of Modern Age, very well-known quarterly uh, journal that was originally founded by Russell Kirk. Uh, between 2010 and 2016, Daniel served as editor at large of the American Conservative, and his writings have been published in a very wide number of periodicals, New York Times, National Interest, Spectator, Reason, and many others. He's also served as the Internet Communications Coordinator for the Ron Paul 2008 presidential campaign. That seems in a different era, but, you know, these things... Uh, as it were, you know, uh, have a have a history, and um, <coughs> it's great to have you with us. Thank you very much for for joining. Um, may I now ask Governor Brown for some thoughts on Paul's essay? Uh, some questions you would like to put to him. Maybe some, um, you know, some arguments that you would like us to uh, to discuss and consider this afternoon. Okay, I first want to say <coughs> that because we have a a range of thinking, uh, conservative thinking, uh, but real cri criticism uh, about some policies in the Middle East, uh, the use of technology to instill fear. And it brought to my mind uh, uh, Pierre Chardin's thought that uh, everything that rises converges. And if we rise to a higher level of discourse and understanding, theological, philosophical, we can find uh, avenues of understanding that would otherwise be closed off. Uh, my second point, uh, responding uh, to uh, Paul's essay, uh, I was struck with the beginning uh, that recounted the speech by John Kennedy at the American University, because that speech embodies a great deal of what Paul's essay has. Uh, that speech, <clears throat> Uh, invokes a, a tradition, a tradition that um, uh, Kennedy talked about with respect to the Russians. We all uh, inha inhabit the same earth. We all have children. We all are concerned about their future and we're all mortal. So that was an exercise in, uh, in reference uh, not to deterrence technology inspiring fear and control, but rather a, uh, a, a acknowledgement of the shared uh, experience of being human and taking off from that, opening up the, the possibility, the pathway of dialogue. Now contrast that with where we are today. Uh, uh, we don't talk about the Russians. They're thugs. Uh, Putin is the thug, a killer, right? He's a killer. Um, it may well be, but that's the, the rhetoric, um, uh, the thinking. And the same with China, uh, genocide, uh, thuggery. All right, that's very different than John Kennedy. At the time he was speaking, the Soviet Union was guilty of all of those sins, thuggery, killing, uh, control, and all sorts of things. But uh, Kennedy uh, was opening up this possibility. Why? Because in the face of horror, in the face of, he was talking about nuclear testing, in the face of, of nuclear weapons, uh, we have to get back to our roots. Uh, back to the fundamentals that we are human beings on this planet. And I think that really is what uh, the essay is about. It's referencing tradition, uh, having a totally plastic view that reality is putty in our hands, as Paul said, then anything is possible. Everything is permitted. Uh, well, uh, that's not uh, the view that Paul's expressing. It's not certainly my view. There are eternal verities. That's a term that that Gregory Bateson used to encompass the biological uh, uh, 
rules, of laws, uh, operations of, of biological reality. And uh, he invoked uh, G G Paul to the Galatians. God is not mocked. Uh, Bateson meant by that, that uh, the biology is not mocked. Uh, the laws that govern uh, our, our universe, our reality, human beings, uh, if you violate them, then you get uh, you get nemesis, you get, you get the, the negative consequences, which we're all finding now in our society. And I just would think that when we think of the 20 year war uh, in, in uh, Afghanistan or even the Vietnam War, that was an exercise in technology and control, but it didn't work. And Paul in his essay ends uh, with a uh, sentence from the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Well, first of all, that's revolutionary in today's world because uh, our leaders don't feel that they commit trespasses. Uh, we only do good. And we're in a, in a, uh, in a crusade to uh, inflict and, uh, and to make everyone accept our good. Well, if you have humility and you realize that we are flawed and we need forgiveness, just like the others, and the faith of President Kennedy was that could lead somewhere. And in fact, it did. So I think there's a lot to be said about uh, examining our technological assumptions, examining uh, how far deterrence can take us and whether deterrence, which is the um, creation of fear through uh, the threat of annihilating the other, which would include annihilating ourselves, whether that fear escalation can lead uh, to the goal we want. That is a more secure, uh, a more peaceful world. I would say it wouldn't. So uh, this uh, topic, technology and truth, is highly relevant uh, in the wake of the debacle in Afghanistan. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, there's lots there for us to, uh, to reflect on. Paul, I will give you a chance to, to respond in just a minute, but I think it'd be good to hear also from David and Daniel. So may I, may I start with, with David and then, uh, and then move on to, to Daniel. David, for some opening thoughts or comments on Paul's essay, or indeed some of the themes that have already emerged. Yeah, <clears throat> it's, a, it's an honor to be uh, in this company. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, the, uh, I, I just had a, two, two comments, two questions um, that uh, touch on things that have been mentioned here, but uh, drawn from, from Paul's, uh, as you said, splendid essay, really uh, provocative. Uh, it's, it's, it's refreshing to, to, to read a, uh, a, a, a discussion that engages a political question, but wants to get to the, the roots. And that's, um, uh, in a way, it, it demonstrates uh, one of the points that it's making, which is that um, uh, to think about something, it's not enough uh, to manipulate and to throw out um, uh, uh, powerful rhetoric to manipulate and, and produce a certain opinion, but uh, that there's an inquiry into, into foundations. And so I, I appreciate that very much. Um, to, the two questions that I have that would be interesting to hear everyone's thoughts on is, uh, first is, um, whether there's a uh, difference between um, a lie in the sort of obvious sense and um, a kind of uh, neutralizing of truth. And, and uh, what I mean by that, I, I, I have in mind in part the, um, the uh, distinction that, that um, Rod Dreher makes you know, between a hard and soft totalitarianism, which I think is a very important distinction that a lot of people are, are discussing these days. But, but it seems to me one of, one of the things that's really unique about American liberalism in contrast to other forms um, is that uh, uh, there tends not to be an explicit rejection of truth in some, in, in, in some obvious sense, um, you know, the insistence on a lie. You know, when, when you lie, to, to, to lie is to recognize that there is such a thing as truth that you're rejecting. It seems to me that there's something much more profound and subtle and, and, and um, uh, diabolical, I, I like that term in this context, um, that's going on with us that, that um, it's, it's not, I mean, I, 
um, I don't know that in political discourse there's there's a denial of truth. I mean, in a certain sense, there's a constant appeal. We need to we need to face the truth. We need to face the facts. We, there's appeal to science, but it, it's we've um, it seems to me we in 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 the liberal form we want to be open to any any possible truth in a way that neutral neutralizes whatever claim it might be and and um, whatever claim it might make, and that 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 can. Um, that can create the impression that you're open to truth, um, and even more open than 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 other civilizations. But but it but it seems to me um, it it's a it's a mechanism of opening to truth in a way that protects us from any claim that it might make, and 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 I think that that creates a, a very different sort of situation in our case. So that's one point uh, that I, I'd be interesting to hear your comments on. The the second one is is related to. to um, to that uh, actually, one last comment on that uh, a, a, a phrase that um, Paul you used in your comments here: "What we can't control, we get rid of." I, I, it seems to me that that would be the older form of a totalitarianism. But there, there's a way in which we what we can't control we allow to to remain present, but we neutralize any claim that it can make. So so we're not actively getting rid of it in a in a certain sense. It, it's it's a it's a more subtle thing. Anyway, the second point is. Um, uh, just to ask um, what exactly, so you've identified, I think, in a way that's really compelling and true, the, the, the idea of a technocratic reason um, that's governing our political discourse. Uh, I, I'd be interested to hear more what uh, an alternative, what, what is it that um, a non-technocratic reason would look like in, in politics? Um, and, and I've increasingly, just in the last year or two, uh, been... Um, Drawn to uh, uh, the notion of, of of authority as a as a a, a, a a notion in politics that needs to be recovered, political authority. Um, uh, we we tend to avoid that term because we associate it with totalitarianism. But Hannah Arendt, whom you quote uh, extensively in your essay, um, and Del Noche, another uh, great political philosopher, both of them uh, say that the that there's an absolute difference between authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Um, we tend to identify them, and 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 uh, I think that that's that identifying of uh, of the two is itself um, an expression of a technocratic sense of reason. So what, what what do I mean by that? It's the very essence of authority to recognize. Um, uh, a claim of of something that exceeds that authority, recognizing an order that precedes it, uh, a theme that was so dear to Simone Weil. Um, you can't have authority unless you're appealing to something that exceeds you. Um, and and uh, th that it seems to me that I mean it's a very simple point, but the, the moment you 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 open that up, um, uh, it seems that the um, political discourse would have to open in all sorts of of interesting and fruit potentially very fruitful ways. Um, and by contrast, our, our identifying authoritarianism and totalitarianism, so our, our assumption that all authority is a form of technocratic control, um, will we'll shut down this, this, uh, this dimension of openness in a way that really is definitive and, and deeply problematic. So those are my two, two basic comments. Thank you very much indeed, David. Daniel. Well, uh, David's remarks just now have brought forward uh, several of the thoughts uh, that have been prompted in my own mind, both by Paul's essay and also by Governor Brown's uh, remarks uh, earlier in this discussion. It seems to me that the way in which a certain truth about human nature has been instrumentalized, operationalized, and perverted by the kind of uh, system of lies under which we live uh, depends upon taking the inner rebelliousness that has been exhibited by human beings uh, as you know, part of their nature from the time of the fall from Eden. And that essential rebelliousness, that resistance to law, that resistance to any authority outside of ourself, um, that has become uh, the virtue or the, you know, sort of uh, the, the taproot, the source of strength within the system under which we live, where, which it says that uh, whatever spontaneous uh, tendencies we might have, whatever our will wishes to be, whatever our will chooses to focus upon, that that is as good as anything else which nature or divine law or revelation might provide to us. So you wind up with a very open-ended system in which, as uh, Paul's essay reminds us, truth is reduced to a purely instrumental level, 
that truth is going to be whatever will effectively allow us to obtain the ends which we have set for ourselves through our will and through our impulses, which we are now uh, going to claim are uh, intrinsically good, even though they in fact derive from a sense of rebellion against nature, rebellion against you know, human authority and rebellion against divine authority as well. This instrumenta instrumentality uh, of reason, this instrumentation of reason, the reduction of it to a mere means to uh, various uh, willful ends, um, also involves, of course, a component of forgetting. I think that's something which um, perhaps is worth adding to or bringing out in Paul's uh, essay. That by focusing on technique, on means, we of course uh, lose sight of ends. And this is, I think, very well illustrated by the foreign policy that the United States has pursued, certainly since the end of the Cold War, and in fact, going back uh, somewhat before that as well. And uh, with uh, this war, which has uh, just thankfully ended, the uh, war in Afghanistan, with the Iraq war to an even greater degree, we saw that all along the way, there was a, an acute focus on technique, an acute focus on metrics, an acute focus on uh, specific facts, which could be either established or not established, things like claims about weapons of mass destruction and what these weapons of mass destruction could do, what they would be used for that always it was a focus on the details and an oblivion with respect to the absolute, you know, sort of bottom line question of how military power being employed by the United States could possibly bring about a just and orderly society in another land, a land very different from our own, and uh, which in fact is subject to authorities that are very different from those that we are accustomed to dealing with. And in our own rebelliousness and our own rejection of all kinds of inherited authorities, um, we find it, I think, extremely difficult even to understand the situation that these other lands are in. And so we look at them purely as suffering under uh, the ill effects of you know, dictatorial authorities, the ill effects of clerics who may go to violent extremes. We're unable to see uh, the complex problem that authority represents in all of these lands. Complex problems regarding tribal authority, family authority, authority of legitimate religious uh, uh, figures as well as uh, the inciters of, of hatred and of violence. We instead have this idea that by uh, damaging all authority, not just the abusive kind, but even the kinds that are, uh, you know, sort of intrinsic to that society, by getting rid of authority and by replacing it with our technocratic knowledge, with our ability to, you know, uh, write fancy constitutions that are going to have the right kind of, uh, you know, setting of one interest against another or, or, or putting together a, a multitude, a pluralism of different forces. We think that this kind of technocratic approach uh, to the details and, 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 and stitching the details together in the right kind of mosaic, that this is going to be a resolution to the fundamental problems of human nature and of politics and of the question of the right kind of just authority within a political order. And of course, we have uh, you know, spectacularly failed to achieve this after 20 years and $2 trillion spent in Afghanistan, uh, we really didn't succeed in doing it in Iraq. And uh, we have not, of course, succeeded in doing it in our own country. And you see this tremendous loss of legitimacy in all of our institutions of authority in this country, whether that is you know, something as remote as the institution of science, for example, uh, whether it's something uh, as concrete as the institution of uh, you know, the federal government. All of these things are losing their sense of legitimacy, their appeal to the American public, because paradoxically, these institutions have often uh, predicated their authority, their claims to authority upon human rebelliousness and, about, and upon a rejection of more traditional sources of authority in religion and in traditional understandings of human nature. So I think uh, Paul's essay has really profoundly brought out uh, the relationship between technology and the great lies under which humanity has had to suffer, uh, certainly since uh, the Bolshevik revolution but continuing through to today, long after the end of the Soviet Union, we continue to see the hubris and the deliberate, you know, sort of self-created ob oblivion and ignorance of human truth, uh, which we, uh, you know, as a country, not only, you know, sort of embody in our own flawed institutions, but also have taken to exporting all around the world with disastrous consequences that continue to disappoint us and to wreak, uh, you know, just untold havoc on the lives of other people. Daniel, thank you very much. Um, and I think, Paul, you've got uh, some very uh, challenging points and, and, and uh, comments there to, uh, to engage with. And, and please take you know, all the time that you, you want. Um, you know, we've got in total about 
75 or, or 90 minutes or so. That means we've got about 60 minutes left if we're going to go to the 90 minutes. So we've got lots of time. Uh, no doubt everyone will want to come in again. Uh, and we've got an audience as well that might want to put some questions to you. So for first round of responses, Paul, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, thank, uh, I flattered everyone um, thought deeply about these questions. And, and uh, I, I know um, Governor Brown, uh, you, you admitted to me earlier that you'd, you'd already read it, the essay twice. And I'm I, I, uh, very honored by Three your times. careful reading. Three times. Yeah. Three times. Yes. Um, this is the difference. I, the uh, the present generation they don't want to read anything on the internet that's longer than two thousand words and so it it's really uh, was I take my head off to the national interest that they were willing to break the rules and and print something on, on the internet that that exceeded the, the usual norms not it but I, I listened carefully to all your comments I, and I'll I'll try to respond to them adequately and maybe add in a couple of questions and further thoughts of my own um, the the uh, I, I noticed, um, and I was glad, uh, Governor Brown, uh, about your being struck uh, by the American University speech uh, of John F. Kennedy. I, I really do think it was, uh, it was definitely the high point of that presidency, and it, it was it was just a remarkable moment. The in the background of that speech is something which um, isn't brought out adequately in the somewhat abbreviated version of my paper. I'll, I'll print the full more academic version later. Um, but in the background of that speech is a conversation that had been going on in the background between the a prominent American journalist, Norman Cousins, Pope John uh, XXIII and, and, and Nikita Khrushchev were involved deeply in negotiations uh, to, to end uh, nuclear testing and in, 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 in fact, to end the Cold War, it, which was something that uh, Khrushchev made clear to Cousins he was very much looking forward to in a second term, uh, which he fully expected uh, Kennedy to win. So he, it was, so this speech, which, which uh, Kennedy made, he, he very consciously was making to American Cold Warriors. He was trying to convince his own society that it, it might be okay to open, to actually contemplate a non-aggressive, non-zero-sum game relationship with its adversary, um, and so it's it, it's it's extremely poignant that that this speech happened you know, two months before his assassination. Now I'll, I'll return to that point uh, perhaps later. As far as the what you know, when when. I think that you raised the question, Governor Brown, about you know what you know what can what can we do and you know, what what is a new direction in foreign policy and the I, I think um, my my area of like the focus of my thoughts tends to be on the philosophical more 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 than on the on the policy details, but I think that the one can inform the other. Um, and the, it's actually also, it transcends the political, but it's also political to say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That, I mean, it says that is what we can do. It, it, it is it's simply to actually take that into the heart of our culture, take it into our own hearts and have that as our attitude, which, you know, paradoxically, ends up you know, having something to do with the realism of a Hans Morgenthau, you know, who's writing you know, in, in the 50s and 60s and was a friend of, of Hannah Arendt. But you know, this idea that you cannot have diplomacy without humility, which means that it, you, know, you can't have humility if you're not willing to admit the truth about your own faults. If you're constantly externalizing all evil onto some other and, and completely ignoring or excusing uh, or finding really lame excuses and, and, and false excuses for the things that you've done. That, you know, there's no way to have real diplomacy and, and you have nothing but sort of technological manipulation left. So I, um, David, um, I, and your point about the, 
the meaning of, of lie being being fundamentally different in a technocratic order, I completely agree with you there. And um, I, I, I tried to make that point, but you, you definitely added to it in your remarks just now. But the, what, what are the points I make in the essay um, is that if, if, if reality itself is simply plastic to our process of knowing and making, you know, to use George Grant's you know, way of, of, of talking about uh, technology, um, then, then everything is exactly, you know, as you say, that there's, there's nothing solid about which you could have a lie. Everything is a process. And, and so, the, so what seems to be, um, you know, I, 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 I think I used the word information war. I think that didn't fall onto the cutting floor as well. But I mean, we wage information wars, not diplomacy. But the information wars, of course, they incorporate what used to be called lies. But they're not really lies because they're part of a process of making and transforming and turning uh, and, and turning other countries into what they should be, which is more like ourselves. And they, you know, they should also be uprooted. They also, they also should have live in this sort of fluid kind of reality of constant reinventions and constant remaking of everything because, because there is no nature there's no, you know, there's, certainly there's no God, there's no being with a capital B. Um, so I, I think that, I'm not sure if that completely responds uh, to, to your, the profound point that you made there. But as, as for a, an alternative, of course, that's, that's, that, that's, the, uh, that's the real rough one. And that's, that's something that um, I look to uh, people on here and uh, others, um, to, to help inform my own thinking on that, certainly Del Noche as well. But the it seems to me that both in, in, in your in Adrian uh, in, in your work uh, with particularly with John Milbank on the politics of virtue and David in, in, in your book on uh, uh, freedom from reality, it seems that one of the commonalities in both of your approaches helps answer that question, um, and and that is that the it's the idea that there's an aristocratic or authoritative element within the political order without which the democratic and the autonomous element within the political order cannot even be itself. It, you cannot have sort of a, a, a say for the people um, and, you, you, and, and a sense of, of freedom and autonomy, although in, now in a relative sense, without there's something being that, that exceeds my autonomy something that I'm uh, in relationship with. Um, the, and, and clearly, I, I think even maybe most fundamentally and profoundly, without an aristocratic sense of truth itself, because I mean, truth itself, if it exists at all, it's aristocratic. It, it means that one person, if, you know, if that one person is Socrates, can be right and everyone else can be wrong. That's not, that's the opposite of what, how Tocqueville saw democracy in America, where, where the truth is whatever 51% say, that, that automatically becomes public opinion and therefore it's true. That's, that's the opposite of an aristocratic order. But, but, but what I would say is that ultimately, if you have nothing but the democratic principle and none of the aristocratic, what the demos thinks that it's believing and making and building is just a lie. It, it's not. It's not. It's not a reality. Maybe would be a better way of putting it. It's not grounded in in anything, and so it can it can just be an, an illusion, and and that's and that's unfortunately, and and I think that's the other part of uh, maybe this returns back to your earlier question. Um, a rent raises the the specter of a of a world where a Sort of a fake total reality is so convincing and so complete that there's no outside of it with which to compare anything. And, and so this is a particularly frightening new type of totalitarianism that wasn't possible before. And you know, the, the most controversial claim in my essay, um, by far, so controversial that I underplayed it 
so that this claim didn't undermine the philosophical argument I was trying to make and that was most important to me. Um, because I don't want to demonize the United States and I don't even want to demonize our intelligence circles. But I would say that the intelligence circles who were involved in the assassination of Kennedy, as I believe Arendt herself saw clearly and stated somewhat cryptically, um, that obliged the creation of, of a parallel world, a parallel political reality, and, 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 and pushed the intelligence circles um, into the forefront of politics. But the intelligence circles are, that's technocracy uh, in its purest form. It, it, they exist to manipulate and to create alternative realities that don't correspond to the real. That's what they do. They're, they're, they're weapons of war. They're not, they're not creative forces oriented towards the good and the real and, and towards exploring what our nature is. Um, but the, and then moving to Daniel, uh, the, the, this is a, this is a tough one. I, 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 Daniel, I hope, I wanted to, uh, I, I hope that we can have a conversation whether here or later uh, about the United States and its history and about the transition from America um, of, of some of the founders um, right through you know, Wilson, who was you know, a deeply believing Christian. And there's, there's, this, there's this important contribution of the Protestant protesting uh, culture that's always been part of the American culture and, and, and a rebelliousness there. And, and, and that's, you know, untethered from a sense of, of metaphysics, a sense of the permanence and the reality of, of the good that becomes ultimately diabolical. The, 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 the thing that's difficult for me is, is that the, you know, the great literature of the 19th century, um, you know, Charlotte Bronte, uh, yeah, or someone like that, I mean, she's, she's a, She's a rebel in a, in a lot of ways. I mean, there's an individualism and, and that's, that's fundamentally Protestant about her heroines. Um, and, and yet there's something culturally priceless in, in, in those creations that we wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to have the world without having gone through that stage, even, even though ultimately I would like to see um, the Christian world be on a, on a on a higher level than the and and a more unified level than they are. I agree with what Governor Brown said that um, I quoting Teilhard de Chardin that at the highest level there, there's unity. But and, and at the end of which is interesting because the, I mean, what could be higher than Charlotte Bronte? At the end of her novel Villette, she actually reunifies the Protestant and the Catholic principles. Which is, you know, it's just, it's just, I think that's a, a fitting symbol of, of where that could go. The, as regarding the, um, the forgetting of ends, the, you know, I, I just, I just had a couple of quick thoughts. Um, for, you know, it's, of course, technology is the substitution of means for ends. That's it. that's maybe the shortest way of, of, of even of even defining it. So naturally, you do, but since you have to have some sort of ends. Uh, that the means themselves become the end, as, as David Schindler has often pointed out. Um, so, you, so you just, you know, you just throw more and more stuff at these crazy wars because you know it's all about the uh, the new gadgetry, you know, and, and that becomes the latest cover story on Time magazine. You know, look at this cool the new gadgetry. You know, that's that's that, that's all the culture cares about. Um, but also, I, I think that it would be good to sometime have a discussion looking at uh, George Grant's reflections on Nietzsche. I'm not a great Nietzsche scholar. I find it difficult to read because it, 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 I just, he kind of gives me the creeps. But, um, but I, I realize he's profound in various ways and, and Grant acknowledges some of that profundity, but there's, there is a sense that he's, that the, the world he created is the world we currently live in, is something Grant says, is, is you know, that, they, that we, we need to become the creators of values. But ultimately what, what in Grant's reading, what Nietzsche is saying is that we need to be the creators of everything. We need to be the creators of ourselves. We need to transcend 
what it meant to be human and to become superhumans and trans, you know, transhumans. And, and there's, uh, there's, it, it, it's quite frightening what's already there in Nietzsche. And I, and I think we're seeing now that the frightening reality of, of his, of those po apparently poetic uh, reflections. And, and, and just one final thing is, is that regarding the, Daniel, you made some very interesting and important points about American, the folly of American policy in places like Afghanistan and, and Iraq. I would, I would just add to that as a response that one of the fallouts of, of, um, of a technocratic civilization, I would say better the replacement of technocracy with what used to be civilization is its presentism. It, it, is, it simply is, it, it, it rejects the past. I'm Simone Weil, as I quote in my essay, says the, the Americanization of the world will entail a world which, is, which loses its past. And, and, and she regularly referred to America as a, a country which is incapable of, under, of having even its own past. And, and so it's, it's naturally when we look at other countries and invade them, who's going to be looking in the process of making the policy at the history of those countries, of where they came from, of their institutions, of what things they value from the past and they, that they want to, to, to keep and maintain into the future. All, if, we, if we were capable of doing that, we most likely wouldn't have invaded any of those countries in the first place. But, and because the, but that's, um, I think, Adrian, tell me if I've, if I've spoken long enough, I can, I have one other thought, but I can pause right here if you'd like to give people a chance to respond. No, no, no. Fin fin finish the thought, Paul, and then we'll do another round. And I can see Governor Brown already would like to come in, but do finish the thought, Paul, because okay. it seems unfair to cut you off halfway through that final thought for now. Yeah, well, just the, this is, yeah, maybe this will end up being a good segue because um, the, this, the, I think that this had to do with, with something that uh, Governor Brown was, was saying earlier about the, the demonization of the enemy and, and how, how characteristic this is and of course how, how, ref, how incredibly unusual it was for, for John F. Kennedy not to engage in that demonization which has become part of the course ever since. And I, I just wanted to reflect just very briefly on why I think that's connected with uh, with a technological mindset. Um, because precisely in order for there to be a technological mindset, you have to eliminate, you, your sense of freedom is no longer oriented towards the concreteness of the, of, of the good. The sense that, the, that, that, there's some, that nature itself is already connected with, is, is incarnating something that's beautiful and good and, and true conditionally and symbolically, but that ultimately you know, it points to something beyond itself, which is unconditionally good. I mean, that, that, that is the pre-technocratic philosophy. And if you throw all of that out and you just say that nature is, is just empty stuff, empty, devoid of meaning, devoid of any symbolic link, which is something that's that's, that's beautiful and true in, um, in the Christian or the Platonic sense. Basically, you're, you're, you're in this world where you have nothing to orient to when you say, okay, well, what, what good shall I pursue having vacated the world of, of its goodness? And so, so, but you nonetheless, you have to act. So how are you gonna act? How are you gonna orient action in the absence of like the forms of the good within your own world? Well, you, the, what, what you end up doing is you find some evil that you're going to conquer. And, and, and it's in the process of conquering that evil, whether, and it may be something that's truly evil, or more likely it's something that's partially evil, just like everything tends to be in this world, like in, in this fallen world. Um, the, and, and then you conquer it and you focus on that. And so you, so you end up, it's it just like the logic of the technological mind itself requires uh, a, a demon and a monster to constantly create and to destroy. Paul, thank you very much. These were, you know, quite um, 
comprehensive reflections that uh, that you offered us in response to the the excellent points made by um, by Governor Brown, by by David Schindler, and by by Daniel McCarthy. Governor Brown would like to come in again, so please. Okay, uh, a couple of points, Paul. I don't know that um, at least I haven't heard about it. Uh, it. It's a fact that the intelligence agencies uh, were implicated in assassinating Kennedy. So I just put that out as want to put a question mark around that. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, with respect to rebelliousness, uh, I'd point out that um, Camus uh, wrote a book called The Rebel, but he also uh, emphasized limits. In the myth of Sisyphus, he talked about limits and referring to uh, Greek culture and, and, and limits that were inherent and uh, recognized there. So we're beyond limits. Uh, and uh, the universe uh, is beautiful because it represents uh, a mind. It, re it, it is, uh, it, there's an order there. Uh, there's an order. Now, if you look at what we're, now there's a lot of people have different views, Republicans, Democrats, Muslims, Catholics, um, people don't believe in, in any particular religion, but there is uh, some anchors. There are some uh, foundational points uh, and, and we know that. We know, for example, that, that uh, we're destroying the climate uh, that nurtures uh, human beings. And we know that we're uh, destroying uh, the habitat uh, that nurtures the diversity of species. And that we are still on a uh, demolition mission uh, unless we uh, stop and uh, recognize the, the limits, the limits inherent in the order of the universe, the, the living uh, life, uh, biology. So uh, that brings up the, the question of recognizing a principle of enoughness. Uh, this is a, a term that Ivan Illich often spoke about, uh, also termed a principle of satiety. Is there any principle of enoughness? And I would have to say <clears throat> in the world of technocracy, there's never enough. Uh, so you never run up against limits, but if you don't have limits, then it's ultimately destructive. And with that respect, if we take what we're doing uh, to put uh, heat trapping gases into the atmosphere, if we're looking at we're destroying uh, millions of other species, if we're looking at uh, how we're handling uh, the virus and its mutations, if you look at the fact that uh, the world is embarked, the big powers of nuclear powers want to build more and more nuclear weapons, including the United States uh, spending uh, hundreds of billions over the next uh, uh, trillion, actually, over the next 30 years to make weapons, uh, little mobile uh, Auschwitzes to, to create massive horror. Now, the argument is, of course, we're not going to create that horror. We're just creating the threat of horror. And then around this fear created by technology, we can create security. They never use the word peace anymore. That, that's not, uh, somehow people don't like that. So I would just have to say that, uh, and I make reference to an English book from out of Oxford, Toby Ord, uh, The Precipice. In there, he puts a one in six chance of humanity going extinct in this century uh, because of runaway artificial intelligence, because of climate excess, because of uh, pandemic uh, bio threats, uh, because of nu nuclear. Um, so humanity has a real limit it has an endpoint we're looking at. And we have some people, whether you agree or not, at least it's a big enough idea that it ought to be encountered. But of course it's not encountered. That's not what we're talking about uh, in Washington now. It's about the exit from Afghanistan, not the threat of extinction or the other formulation, the unrecoverable collapse of civilization as a real idea. Now, if you really believe that, you wouldn't just, vilify uh, President Xi or the Chinese, you'd figure out uh, some pathway. St. Ignatius uh, always told uh, his companions, go, go in the door of the other person, but take them out your own. What, I'm, what I believe he meant by that, listen really well and be able to state what the other person's perspective is, and then slowly bring them around to the extent you can, to your own perspective. And in that process, you have what Martin Buber would have called 
a dialogue. Uh, you don't get that when you invoke genocide, particularly not coming from a country that kidnapped little children, put them in boarding camps and uh, brainwashed them so they didn't know their own language, their own tradition. So we have, I don't wanna say America bad, I just wanna say America human. And if we take, and this is the great challenge now, we're noticing slavery, we're noticing the destruction of the Indians. Uh, we're noticing that we stole half of Mexico in a trumped up war in 1846. But in the face of that, how do we see the greatness of our forebears? And that is really the challenge. San Francisco, the school board, uh, you know, it was stopped by a popular revolt, uh, wanted to take out the names of Lincoln, Washington, Paul Revere, uh, Jefferson, you name it, because they were they did bad things. At the same time, uh, our nation's leaders are saying we are so good that we have to dominate the Afghan people and we have to vilify, we can't talk uh, to uh, China or Russia unless we follow this formula. As you start the meeting, you say, be good, you bad. Now, do you get that? Do you know you're bad and you know I'm good? Okay, now we can talk. That is the death of any dialogue. And without in any way uh, minimizing uh, what the Chinese or the Russians have done, but we can't minimize what we've done or the human element that we all share. So that would be my point. Techno technocracy is a leveler. It's a uh, destroyer of limits and a destroyer of any respect for the sacred. Thank you very much indeed. Governor Brown. Paul, I'm going to ask you to come back um, now so that we, um, you know, get the, well, keep the discussion going and, and make sure that you can respond sort of quite, quite promptly to, to the points. Can I just add one thing and it sort of builds on what Governor Brown just said, which is, you know, you, I think in the presentation, perhaps more than in the essay, um, you sort of use technology and technocracy almost as synonyms. Now, you know, of course we can see the overlap, but I think it'd be quite interesting perhaps to just distinguish a little bit and perhaps also to say, given that we talked about alternatives earlier, you know, what sort of culture institutions would we need for us to use technology, you know, for the good ends, for the, you know, for the ends of promoting human flourishing, you know, reconciliation, you know, substantive dialogue between cultures and civilizations and faiths, and, and in that sense, you know, a, a peace that isn't just a, a cessation of, of hostilities. Uh, and, and, you know, and I suppose, you know, you said technocracy is essentially sort of, you know, disregarding limits, which I think is a very interesting uh, definition. Um, you know, I wonder whether there's more to be said about, about technocracy, whether it's not just a disregard uh, for limits, but in fact, the, you know, the transgression of all sorts of taboos and the fact that we replace judgment, ethical and political judgment with essentially something anonymous, right? Something impersonal. And in that sense, it, it flies in the face of a more religious conception of, of humanism, or even if you like a secular humanism, but that is still open to sort of, you know, metaphysical sensibility and, and the fact that reality is, is, is really mysterious, not, not a sort of atheism in the way that, you know, Rodre and you, you know, of course, rightly, uh, reject as sort of totalitarian, but I do wonder where you know where you know what else we can say about the differences between technology and technocracy, uh, you know, because I I think we want to be clear that technology in the primary sense of essentially an extension of our human limbs, the fact that you know humans have always used tools to kind of perfect themselves and the world that they live in, you know that that's not something which is in and of itself the problem, right? but it's rather you know, when technology uh, acquires a sort of power to transgress uh, and to become perhaps part of a, of a soft or, or indeed a harder totalitarianism. So just, you know, to add that to, to the points just made by, by Governor Brown. But would you, should I respond now or, or would you prefer I wait uh, as the moderator? No, perhaps if you, if you um, respond briefly now and then we bring in David and Daniel again, uh, and then that allows for more sort of exchange. Right? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be to be brief to, uh, in order to allow for more of a conversation. But the, I mean, it is. It's it 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 can be that uh, at times I think that I, I may be imprecise in in my in my language, but I think it, it may also be that the sense in which I'm using the word technology is not the ordinary one. Um, I, I I'm not using technology as a synonym for tools or or you know or very sophisticated tools that they are modern tools. I I'm really um, I'm, I'm more when I'm speaking of the technological way of, of, of understanding the world is, 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 is more what I, I'm trying to emphasize it, it, is that, you know, which is modern. I mean, it is probably starts with Descartes, you know, that you, to know something is to know it absolutely and completely in all its parts sort of mechanistically. And, and, and therefore you can only know what you make. And so that, it, so that, it, so that, that the technological way of knowing is ends up overlapping with, with what you manufacture. And, and, and then that, and that, that is what leads to, um, a, a, it's just a fundamentally different sense of, of sort of ontology and, and, and metaphysics. I mean, you, you, you can't, you kind of, you, you lose the metaphysics if, if that's the way you, you, you view the world because I mean, you, can't, you can't know the divine in, 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 in all its mechanistic detail. You only know it approximately, you know, as St. Paul uh, most eloquently put it. Um, but the, so the, but it, I mean, but a technocracy, just as distinct from it, from that technological way of knowing, I simply mean as in a polity where that technological mindset has now become the dominant one. It's the dominant logic of, of the society as a whole. So to me, the two are, are closely related. But that, that's all I'll, I'll say on that. Uh, as regarding um, the, uh, I, I, I agree with um, the, the importance and the, the interest of, of, of Camille uh, in the context of this uh, discussion. I was glad to hear his name uh, of the, the great uh, French existentialist writer um, mentioned here. And he, I haven't read uh, The Rebel, but I, I, I should, but it, it, it's absolutely true. Um, his concern with, with limits. Um, and I, I just wanted to say quickly that um, he was one of the biggest fans of, of Simone Weil's uh, The Need for Roots. Um, he, he's, he thought it was the, the most important thing to read after, uh, after the war as for, for France trying to read ground itself in a, in, in, a, in a civilization that it had almost lost. Um, the, I, I think the, the, you know, the, I also see a lot of overlap between Illich and, and Simone Bay, uh, the, the, but I, I, I'm not going to go into that. The, the, um, the, The thing about artificial intelligence is is a very interesting one, and I'm not that it's more important than the, than the greenhouse issue or the environmental issues or the nuclear weapons issues. They're all very important, but I think I just think as a philosophical point, I, I think it's it's interesting that you you have to have a collapse in the sense of what it means to be human before the problem of artificial intelligence can rise to the level that it has, because I mean only. Only a very degraded sort of anthropology could fantasize about downloading human consciousness onto silicon chips, or, or, or having, you know, having artificial intelligence be just as good, or maybe better than than humans. I mean, it, it, you can't. I, I mean, the very even even if it ends up only being a fantasy, the very fact of having those fantasies to me suggests that you have a. Uh, an anthropological crisis on your hands. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave my comments at, at that for now. I'd like to hear from everyone else. Yeah, so maybe um, Daniel this time first before I turn to David, if that's okay, just to um, mix things up a bit. 
Certainly. And um, you know, the references to Simone uh, Weil uh, just a moment ago uh, put me in mind of the fact that uh, Russell Kirk, uh, like uh, Albert Camus, was also a great admirer of the need for roots. And uh, Kirk's own The Roots of American Order was directly inspired by Simone Weil. Um, there's a, a passage from Weil that um, uh, Paul quotes towards the end of his essay, however, which I think is quite sobering. And uh, the passage reminds us of the centuries during which uh, the Roman Empire endured. Um, you know, despite having been built on certain lies about human nature and uh, despite having been built on a tremendous abuse of authority. And uh, it's a sobering uh, passage because it reminds us that uh, for all that there is a tremendous inauthent inauthenticity to uh, the order under which we live and uh, for all that it has uh, the sense of declining legitimacy, nevertheless, it may uh, persist for quite some time. And um, you know, we never know the, uh, the hour or the day uh, when uh, a change is going to come. And uh, it may be quite some time coming, in which case uh, part of the challenge is to uh, mitigate uh, what we cannot uh, get beyond. And uh, the sense of limits uh, comes into play both uh, as something that we must restore in terms of our uh, outlook overall on you know, human life and, and political life as well, but also uh, limits simply as a matter of necessity. Uh, in a world which uh, presently it does not believe in them, even though it is constantly running up against uh, the actual limits of, for example, what our bomb power has been able to achieve in uh, the developing world, uh, the limits of what our um, technological attempts to solve and ease the uh, difficulties of life have, have led us into uh, with our consumer society, and also the uh, temptation simply to use technological, uh, you know, sort of efficient means to try to address the consequences of that consumer society as well. So there is a sense in which technocracy uh, and technology, they create problems, and then uh, the solution is only conceived of in technological and technocratic terms. And uh, I fear that this could go on for some time, and yet reality does have a way of uh, impinging upon our, our lies and our fantasies uh, sooner or later. And even if we don't know exactly what the time frame will be, uh, we have to be ready both for the ultimate, you know, sort of uh, rearrangement of institutions, but also in the meantime, we have to find a way, uh, a sort of modus vivendi, a way to you know, make the best of a world in which uh, our institutions may uh, be unregenerate for some time. Daniel, thank you very much. Um, very interesting parallel with um, Simone Weil's point about how long a, uh, you know, a system can endure even um, uh, after it's already been shown to be, um, you know, intellectually, morally um, problematic or even bankrupt. David, may I turn to you for some more comments or arguments before asking Paul to respond? Thank you. Um, I wanted to um, touch uh, back on, on a, a point that Paul made, and, and it connects with a point that uh, Governor Brown has made a couple of times, and that, that is um, this, this problem of demonizing the enemy um, and it's interesting to, to think that through how, how it's essentially connected with technocratic reason, as, as Paul, you're, you're suggesting. Um, one, one of the, um, the, the correlate of a technocratic sense of reason is a, is a, frag, a fragmentary sense of reality. And, and, and one of the ways to describe a fragmentary sense of reality is, is a tendency to, to absolutize the part uh, because we can't recognizes a part in relation to it to another whole and 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 I think this this demonizing is a is an expression of that I mean it's it's interesting um, the 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 only way to avoid absolutizing the you know evil that one sees in the enemy is as as Governor Brown pointed out many times uh, recognizing a kind of something that's common that precedes it I mean we can only uh, uh, avoid absolutizing by relativizing, and then we need something real that precedes us, to which we can relativize the the, the faults. And and this um, uh, failure to recognize this 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 structural, institutionalized, um, radicalized uh, uh, incapacity to recognize any sort of an overarching or pre preceding truth means that we we will necessarily. Um, uh, absolutize the evil that we see in others. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about uh, political discourse, our political discourse, you know, politics in its very essence is a, is a, is a deliberation. 
and as a deliberation, it means that it, it's, it is focused on means rather than ends, but that, that doesn't mean um, uh, that the ends are absent in a, in a healthy uh, society. Uh, politics recognizes its, its subordination to a larger order. And so in, in political debate, we deliberate about the best means to achieve an end that we, we all can see as given. And in, it seems to me in, in, our, in our society, we, because we don't, because we've in a way eclipsed the question of ends, we can't but absolutize means. And so it seems to me that, that our politics become a, becomes a substitute for religion. It becomes a substitute for metaphysics. Um, uh, and it's going to take the character of this, this, this radical violence and a total, you know, as we, call, as we say, say, kind of a polarizing. Um, we see we see so many expressions of that. Uh, you know, the, w w w one is is this the, the wokeism that, that you're talking about in, in the you know uh, critical race theory. I mean, it may, it may be the case that we are identifying genuine evils in the in the past, but but it's it's not obvious that that should mean that we absolutize those evils. We're going to absolutize them, uh, and therefore require a complete dismissal if we're incapable of recognizing you know the bigger picture to which these things are relative um, and I think that's that's an that's a particular uh, problem with our with our contemporary culture so all this raises then the big question is what what is it that's that um, suffices to unify us you know as as people of the West as Americans um, uh, Governor Brown has mentioned a couple of times, you know, the laws of biology, and I, you know, I wonder if that's adequate anymore. I mean, in a certain sense, I would, I, I see the truth of that, but if we, if we think of, of, of nature precisely as something that we're learning, you know, maybe not yet, maybe, maybe it's got its hand, uh, uh, the upper hand now, but it's only a matter of time before we can change it. It, it can't possibly serve as a as a as a truth to which we're beholden. It becomes a problem that we that we can overcome. And I, I wonder, you know, is it is it in the end possible to uh, re overcome a technocratic sense of reason if we don't recover our tradition in its fullest sense? And that means theological, metaphysical, literary, cultural sense. Um, uh, um, yeah, that, that's 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 my question. Um, I, I noticed that there is in the uh, Q and A. Yeah, there's not, there's also a brief question um, from uh, I, I I assume he doesn't mind if I mention his name from George Beebe. Um, yeah. uh, could I should I just read that? Yeah, let's read that out so that everyone can can see it. So. George writes, writes this, technocracy's denial of nature's limits has enormous implications for American foreign policy, as well as for our ability to govern our own selves effectively. If we can bend the world to our will, why rein in our ambitions or attempt to balance our objectives and our capabilities? What do we do about this problem? How can we restore a sensible appreciation of the limits that, re that reality imposes and what we should attempt to achieve in the world? So this goes back to some of the discussions and points already raised about you know, the absence of limits when it comes to technocracy and indeed to, to the unmediated power of technology, which is I think what really your essay is getting at, Paul, is not technology in and of itself so much as the unmediated power of technology that then essentially becomes an extension of an unmediated limitless will. And of course we know that that you know, will to power that self-assertion, you know, is you know a long-standing temptation, right? Uh, I mean, since the fall, as has been mentioned, right? Uh, and that when we've given that a whole philosophical, theological, political framework, right? You mentioned Descartes. I mean, we 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 might want to go back even you know even further and maybe think about the origins, you know, in terms of voluntarism and nominalism in the Middle Ages, or indeed certain strands of ancient thought that were not as relational. And we're not ultimately compatible with a sort of trinitarian uh, ontology and framework. That you know that that then means you know we will see it every t in every period in human history the temptation to replace a sense of limit with you know limitless power. And of course, uh, I think that is what what you're what you're getting at. But please do take some time to respond to the points made by uh, Daniel, David, and before that, 
uh, also by Governor Brown. We have a good uh, 10, 12 minutes left before we will wrap up uh, yeah. after 90 minutes. So Paul, maybe if you take sort of eight minutes or so, and then we'll have some very final concluding remarks from everyone and we'll, um, we'll wrap up for today. So over to you, Paul. Yeah. Um, mm. is, is, everyone, is everyone okay with that? If people are okay with the time? And I, I will have to, at 1.30, I, I, I'll probably have to run myself. So that'll be a hard limit on our discussion, even though this is um, such a privilege to, to engage with all of you in, in this conversation. It, it just I, All of your points that you're making are, 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 are fascinating um, in, in and of themselves. But the, the, um, the starting in the order that they came with, with, with uh, Daniel's uh, uh, really interesting points, um, and and uh, I I I detect a kind of pessimistic mood in 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 your comments, Daniel, about the uh, how the evil we have to assume is ultimately self-limiting, but it's not necessarily self-limiting as quite as quickly as one would like. Um, and the you know the really the. Um, It just while I was listening to you, the, the thought that came to mind was there's a, there's a beautiful, beautiful passage um, in uh, Gravity and Grace, where uh, Simone Weil is 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 re reflecting on uh, on World War II, and and this is like at a time when it wasn't clear what the outcome was going to be, but it was already clear that the the bombing of London had failed, and that and that the Nazis were not going to successfully invade. England, despite being by far the, the you know the most powerful military force on the planet at that point, and so, and she she makes this metaphor how a you know a wave in the ocean rises, and, and rises, and without any apparent force um, to keep it from rising to infinity, it, it nonetheless crashes. It ultimately, in the end, and, and in the same way, you know the uh, the German war machine. Um, though there was really nothing to stop it at that point. Nonetheless, you know, some, something internal to the logic of reality forced it to crash and, and, it, and it came down. So that, that, that everything, so she, of course, her, you know, her wonderful Greek sensibility, you know, realized that, that there, there's nothing, nothing expands in its power indefinitely. And technocracy ultimately uh, does not as well. The, my fear here though, uh, and it's it's a fear that you know is, is already present in in C.S. Lewis's uh, wonderful essay, *The Abolition of Man*, and and in, in the uh, companion novel, uh, the, *The That Hideous Strain*. Um, is that that there can be there can be a sense where there's if if you change what it means to be human in the first place. Um, is, is it possible that there, there can be a, a no turning back at some at some point? Um, and and that 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 is, but that 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 would sort of change the whole game. But I I don't know whether that's possible to to, to deal with. It has it hasn't been possible so far. But it it, it is it is definitely a, a concern. The um moving on to. David, um, let's see if I can recall the, the details of your argument. The, you, you mentioned that, that the demonizing um, in order to not demonize it has to be a recognition of, of something that's greater that precedes it uh, or, or that something, something in common that's shared. And of course, you know, I think that that's a, that's a very profound point. And it's the point, um, which it's kind of a shame we couldn't go into it in more detail in, in, in the framework of, of a single conversation. If we were at a conference, we'd have a, we'd probably, we'd have a day or two in coffee hours to chat about all of this stuff, which would be which is just as, uh, maybe more evidence that the uh, technology of Zoom um, is also not just as good as real conversations in person or real conferences um, that uh, of the sort that Telos often puts together in real places, but the um, but I, I want to nonetheless 
you know, bring out a point that that has been somewhat neglected is, you know, this, is that the, the could we really have had how could we have found that commonality with something as as horrible as the Soviet Union? I mean, for for all of these decades, and, and Dreyer, to my chagrin, I, although I agree with Dreyer in many points, and I I I um I really feel that there's a that there there is this mistake that he makes, which is the same one, David, that you also pointed out. How we, you focus on just one aspect of the phenomenon rather than looking at the whole. And, and, and that's the way you manage to, to pursue this kind of demonization. And if, if you just focus on, you know, if you focus on the 1930s under Stalin and collectivization, um, and that's all of the Soviet Union, well, then it's just, it's just it's this horrible place. I mean, the, you know, the, the, but I mean, the Soviet Union itself was just so much more complex than that. And it, and it was and it recovered a sense of history. It recovered a sense of of, of tradition. It, it 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 there were many things in in the reality of the Soviet Union that we could have had a dialogue with. There, um, I mean, for goodness sake, I mean, Khrushchev, who was really pretty awful in, in terms of religious freedom, on the one hand, and he, he destroyed a bunch of churches. He was no saint at all, but he. He read John uh, the twenty John the twenty third uh, gave him a copy of his Pace and uh encyclical and read it and appreciated it and shared it proudly with his uh, other people in the Politburo. I mean, there was a they were human beings still in the Soviet Union. They 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 were they were still participants in the culture of of they 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 of you know of, of German. Um, idealism. I mean, that was part of their tradition too. The literature of the past was part of their tradition. I'm not talking about the 1930s, but by the 50s and 60s and 70s, that was completely part of their culture. They, they, they were, and I just, I think that, that in order to have a healthy relationship with Russia, we need to stop, we need to have a healthy relationship with all of its history and not divide people in the in, in Russia and the Soviet Union into categories to say, this person still says some things that are were good during the Soviet period, therefore they're anathema and we can't talk to this person. That, that's, I, I, why, why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, even Berdyaev didn't have that attitude about the Soviet Union. Um, so I, I, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but the, um, the but as, as the, the last point that you made, David, um, reminded me of, you know, of the reason we called our magazine on the, on the Simul Valley Center website Landmarks, um, because the authors, Landmarks is also the name of this collection of, of essays by Russian philosophers after the 1907, 1908 uh, first revolution in Russia, where the woke revolutionaries of their day sort of with their nihilism really shocked the real philosophers and said, wait a minute, we, we need to rethink what, what's going on. And, and precisely, they make a point very similar to the one that you made, that in the absence of any kind of uh, genuinely existing uh, ontological order, without, without acknowledging the existence of the good, politics becomes absolutized. These relative things and these relative claims, which may be true within their relative factuality, take on this fanatical, absolutized kind of uh, importance. And, and then you, you go out and, and, you, and you have to kill off or throw into camps or, or otherwise uh, banish from society people who don't share th this, this, this now sort of theocratic approach towards the, the relative and the, and the, and the, and the political. So I, I, it's, it's really, I, I think, an, not only is it an important point, it's, it's, it's a frightening one because it describes the reality we're currently in, 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 in the United States. Um, anyway, that's, I think, I, Thank you. I, I, I run out of gas with that last final comment. Paul, I think that in itself would be, uh, you know, another, you know, worth of an, worthy of another seminar discussion. Um, but let's um, conclude this one. May I uh, ask Governor Brown for some uh, short concluding thoughts and then the same with David and Daniel and we'll, we'll call it a day in, uh, in just under five minutes. 
Okay, uh, referencing the ontology, the good, uh, the greater order of which we're all a part. Uh, the Russians had a tradition reaching back uh, into Christianity and uh, European philosophy. So th that, that uh, I think is easier to understand. In fact, to China, uh, that's a different basis. Uh, but if you look at Taoism, uh, if you look at Confucianism, you look at the respect for tradition that uh, in the midst of whatever revolutionary thinking is going on, there is in China still that sense of the greater order in the form of tradition, uh, different from ours, but nevertheless an order that uh, should or could limit the excesses of the technocratic thrust of the party, uh, this will to power. Uh, there's no limits uh, of, the, uh, of the good, of something external. So I would just say that we've got to figure out, we've got to, uh, as Paul said, uh, Russia was more complex, China is more complex, uh, both today and looking at it historically. So I get back to the idea that we, the world is facing the unrecoverable collapse of its civilization. This is not a joke. It's not a metaphor. Uh, it's not a, a febrid, uh, you know, fantasy. Uh, this is considered judgment uh, by serious people. It could be wrong, but it's serious enough that it ought to uh, instill, uh, well, I'll have to go back to some fear and trembling. I think we ought to be thinking harder about where we are in the face of the horror. Now, horror alone can't motivate. We do need the good, the beauty, we appreciate that. So I think that's what we've been talking about today. And for whatever reason, uh, I definitely see uh, there's a path forward in the midst of this utter wasteland. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Brown. David. Before, before just just insert very quickly, um, I realized that I didn't properly respond, although I think others of, of your comments already have, but just to bear in mind what in your final comments uh, that um, George Beebe had, uh, was also interested in your ideas on um, how, how do we restore a sense of limits and in, in, in including in our foreign policy. I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the last, uh, uh, my last comment was is uh, the one that that uh, Governor Brown began with. Everything that rises must must converge, and 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 uh, the the path forward for us is the path back. In a way, we need to we need to go and find out what's re recover what's best in our own tradition. Um, we tend to stop at the in America at the at the revolution as the as the beginning, but I, I think that that um, that becomes self undermining. We need to recover. Um, the regraft uh, even the American uh, tradition in, uh, onto the, the greater vine um, of, of Western civilization, which, imp which it, it will entail even an interpreting of America against herself, as it were. Um, but I, I don't think that there's any alternative uh, given the, the gravity of the crisis. Thank you, David. Daniel. Well, I'd simply say that um, I think there might be a sequel essay that Paul could write uh, about facing the truth. And I think that would be my response to uh, George Beebe's question, that in order to restore a sense of limits, we have to be very honest about what has not succeeded and why it has not succeeded. And uh, we can't uh, stop our analysis simply at the technical level, to say that mistakes were made in the way we withdrew or that uh, you know, there was a flaw in the initial uh, invasion or occupation plans. We really have to look at uh, the full spectrum of uh, failures here on the part of our effort to uh, change another civilization and also at the deficiencies within our own civilization that uh, impose really strict limits on our power, even though our will does not want to observe those limits and our theories often tell us that we can transcend those limits when in fact we cannot. Well, can uh, I just add, Daniel, I, if I write it, I, I'm gonna send it to you and hope that modern age will consider publishing it. <laughs> Most definitely. There is a, there, there's a, there's a great pitch at the end and a, and, a, and a challenge. So we look forward to the next essay, Paul. Thank you again for gifting us this one, which was the basis for what I thought was an incredibly rich and lively and, and splendid debate. I mean, just if I may add one thought, you know, we were told 
some uh, 30 years ago so that we might be facing a clash of civilizations, right? the famous thesis by Samuel Huntington. Uh, I don't think Huntington was wrong about everything. There's lots in his analysis that I think is still very stimulating, not, not least the fact that geopolitics and international relations really are about civilizations and culture, not so much about the economy or, or, or other things. But perhaps the, the pivot now is the forces of civilization versus the forces of barbarism within each civilization. And I think this is the point at which we are, that each civilization across the world uh, faces some uh, you know, diabolical demonic forces. And if it can't come to grips with them, then you know, that civilization, those civilizations may well you know, face uh, a slow demise or perhaps you know, a more sudden collapse. Uh, I, I was reminded when we talked about crisis, about this line in uh, Hemingway's uh, novel, The Sun Also Rises, where Mike is asked, how did you go bankrupt? And Mike responds, well, in two ways. First, gradually, then suddenly. And that is perhaps how uh, you know, civilizations collapse. It takes a long time, but then suddenly something happens quite dramatic. So again, Paul, my thanks for your essay. Uh, my thanks to Governor Brown, to Professor uh, David Schindler, and to, and to Daniel McCarthy for your uh, contributions, your wonderful comments and uh, points this afternoon to all of you for attending. Uh, this has been recorded, so uh, this will be something we can go back to. And uh, as was said, this is only the first uh, in a series of webinars and Paul will be the one to keeping us informed about the next ones. Thank you again all very much. Have a very good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you.